everyone, I'm Dr. Necka. Welcome to our new series of Community Conversations. We are centering the Black perspective on redefining Black futures. If you are new to the channel, please like and subscribe for notifications. If you've already subscribed, we genuinely appreciate you. So listen, I need your help. We have some phenomenal folks with us. So please share the videos with the Oakland community and anyone concerned about what's happening in Oakland. Now let's get into the video. All right, everybody. So this is a very rich conversation. I think the people who view this video will be inspired. I have some follow-up questions for each of you I'd like to ask. And first, I'd like to start with Kita. So Kita, my first question is, who do you think should be at the table when decisions are made in relation to community and economic development? Now, before you hit that question, I have a reason for asking this. You and I have something in common. I majored in urban planning at Morehouse College. Hey. Right. So I know exactly what you're talking about. I came back to Oakland. I grew up uh, in Brookfield Village. Oh. 98th Avenue, right. Yay. Back in the day, they used to call us the Jungle Boys. <laughs> so I got connection. All those neighborhoods that you mentioned, Andre, I ran those areas as well. <laughs> my my family, I had family who lived in 6-9 Village. I remember the time when you couldn't even drive in that area. They would stop you at the gate during the time of Felix Mitchell and say, "Who, where are you going? Who you know in here? <laughs> so I remember those days. But let me ask my question again, Keita. Who do you think should be at the table when decisions are made in relation to community and economic development for the city of Oakland? Good question. Uh, yeah, like uh, Amina said earlier, it's, it's going to be going to be drilled in in terms of credible messengers and um, folks from the community, um, as Andre was was eloquently saying earlier, to put it simple, like, yes, folks from the community. And what does that look like? Who is that exactly or whatnot? Um, and what tables exactly are we talking about um, to make these decisions? Um, really, really quickly, I've been holding, been wanting to say, uh, so going back real quick, when you mentioned Jerry Brown, uh, Andre, around that same time of the Jerry Brown era, it was also a thing called redevelopment. It was it was RDA, the redevelopment agency. So that was the agency that basically was responsible for uh, financing or for funding the redevelopment of neighborhoods. And then that completely disappeared. I forgot not disappeared. It was taken away. Forgot politically why or such. And I wouldn't be surprised again if it was intentional. I'm pretty sure it was. And so that kind of just really handicapped us from being us, Oakland, from being able to do development in different neighborhoods at a level of these other different prominent neighborhoods, because now we got to pull it out of grants and philanthropy and other places. They do have the development block grant, but that's very small. Um, but so nevertheless, just kind of knowing that that's been a thing, I wanted to say that, um, and also shout out to EOYDC alumni from there. And uh, power to the people of Dominique Ware. I've been knowing him since I was a kid. I'm from Stone City. So I'm down the street from Brookfield, where Dominique Ware is from. So that's the kind of people, getting back to, that's the kind of people we need at the table or whatnot. Like I went to elementary school with him. So, and, and all, all skin folk and kin folk, I'll tell you that, or whatnot, straight up. That's why I left the nonprofit. So <laughs> to just go do this work on my own because I'm trying to make impact. I'm not here for the bureaucracy. I'm not here for the clout and the deals and all of that. So I need people at the table like me. <laughs> I don't know how to say that. I need other people like that with shared values and integrity and that that share the same common ground that we all been here talking about, you know, being stewards of our own community, having that ownership to do of our community what we want to. You know, I'm really more on a, on a revolutionary side. I do this city planning within the context of this society and that would exist right now because that's what we have or would not but definitely working with different type of, of <laughs> other groups that's really trying to work in more decolonized ways and break away from this system and society and go create and plan and develop our own place or would not and so simultaneously while that's happening you know we we're here with what we have and so yeah i want to make sure that more folks from youth from yes, from the age of twelve, from from the from the time that people are emotionally intelligent to make a decision or whatnot, like they need to be at the table informing. Uh, and again, what table or whatnot? If it's whether it's a project, 
whether it's a um a meeting or whatnot, like you were mentioning earlier, Karen, about basic civic duties and engagement or whatnot, or just civic amenities that we are owed. Um, like we need the just the common regular folks, my grandmother or whatnot. Like they talk about this stuff all the time. It just don't reach the right channels. And that's part of what got me into this work. Cause I'm like, bro, we talk about this all the time. I go to the block. D boys, they talking about issues. They got kids and stuff too. Like they may have taken over the mini park because nothing has been done with it. So now culturally they're using it, you know, as as their space. But people are always having these conversations, literally. And that well, that was part of my work and my niche is to be a consultant that can reach these places that and and hear these conversations and bring them to the proper spaces to the tables. That's what I'm saying. Like, what are the tables? Because we got to create our own. Or we, again, we have to go ahead and have those tables meet us or where we at or whatnot. So um, for me, who should be at the table? Again, like we all said, like the community, that's from the youth to our grandma, to the deep boy, to the homeless person, like everybody had perspective or whatnot. You know, again, making sure we do that in a safe and respectful way. And folks that have, again, aligned values and integrity, I'm a, I'm a double say all skin folk and kin folk, just because you poor don't mean it's you, you liberal and progressive, like it's a lot of complexities out here. And so I think we need to start with at least having the people again with the shared common understanding that we want better for our community. We deserve it. Again, like Karim was saying, like, yes, it's a mess out here. But at the same time, it's a beautiful mess for me. I wrote a, a Oakland love letter recently, and that's what I describe it as a beautiful mess because it is. There's so much opportunity just drenched everywhere, but sometimes you can't see it through the despair. And so, yeah, I think we, we need more folks that um, like us, you know, to be at those table and um, also different in the generations. Um, there's power. I think Karim, somebody said it. There's so much sauce in East Oakland, again, from the youth to the elder and intergenerationally, making sure that uh, we're creating the tables, we're bringing the conversations, the tables to us, you know, where, where we need to in these different spaces, from projects to city council meetings to um, just neighborhood crime prevention council meetings and things like that. But in a nutshell, we, the community, like the real people, like the, the the folks, I don't know how you want to describe it without insulting anybody, but like the people. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Thank you. Okay. My next question is for uh, Corinne. And I want to preface this. M one of my first jobs after I graduated from Morris College with a degree in urban planning, I worked for a company in Atlanta called Quality Living Services. It was a senior citizen uh, center in Atlanta, Metro Atlanta. And it was led by Miss Irene Richardson. I want to give a shout out to her and I want to tell you why. When I was there, I was a transportation planner and a program manager. Uh, and I saw how Miss Richardson would hold e public events and evi invite the citizens from Atlanta and invite the public officials to come and answer questions from the members of Quality Living Services. I saw her hold those public officials accountable and say, look, we put you in office and if you don't make decisions in our interest, we'll take you out of there. And so I think we, as concerned citizens in Oakland, can learn a lot from the leadership that Ms. Irene Richardson continues to provide at Quality Living Services and in Atlanta. We need that kind of leadership. So the question I have for you, Corinne, is what does good and effective leadership look like when serving the general public in a city like Oakland? Um, that's a good question. Um, and before I answer the question, like when Keto was talking and everyone's been talking, one thing that's been resonating with me is stop counting people out. Mm -hmm. Stop, stop assuming because they qualified on paper that they qualified in practice. Like mm -hmm. stop assuming that there's a lot of people that are qualified for leadership because of their personal life experiences. So you guys see me on this panel talking and, and I work at a law firm now and I was lobbying on Capitol Hill. Before that, I was in jail. And before that, 
I got shot down in San Francisco. So until you hear my story, until I share all of that, people assume that I live a certain quality type of lifestyle. Stop assuming, stop counting people out. There's a lot of people who have been previously incarcerated who are going to make very good leaders. They're going to make right. very good leaders. They just need the right push. They need the right resources and the right relationships. If it wasn't for a lot of relationships I have, like with my professor, I met her at Mills College. She changed my life. She changed my perspective. So without those relationships, a lot of people fall in the cracks. And that's where we losing a lot of good leaders. Um, a lot of these kids out here that's that's real active in the streets, they got a lot of good potential. Um, they just need someone to take the time out to really spend with them. Like um, you guys have mentioned the trauma and PTSD, like it's a war zone for them. It's no different from people that are actually in the military going out to war. They're experiencing a lot of mental and emotional trauma. Um, I think good leadership looks like people showing up every day, not necessarily getting it right every time because we're not perfect people, but showing up, being consistent. Um, and being engaged, um, like Keita was saying, bring the kids to the table. So we're talking about what Oakland needs. We need to ask, ask the kids what they need, because I know what I want Oakland to look like, but that's not necessarily what may be best for Oakland um, or best for the kids that actually have to come up in Oakland. So bringing them to the table, bringing grandma to the table, because she has a very lived experience um, and she's a good leader. She led a household and she birthed a lot of leaders. Um, so bringing previously incarcerated people to the table, I have family and friends who are doing some serious time, but when I talk to them on the phone, that, that, that time in jail has really shifted their perspective and opened their eyes. They see things that I don't see. It's a privilege that I don't have to experience some of the things that they've experienced, but that same experience has really changed their perspective. They need to be at the table for sure. And they need to be afforded an opportunity to redeem themselves and put themselves in leadership positions because they mm -hmm. definitely can lead. I mean, mm -hmm. if you can lead a household with a with a couple of dollars these days, you you, <laughs> you got some leadership potential. <laughs> sure. So, so um, I think a good, effective leader doesn't look like what we think they look like or what society says a good leader looks like. We need to get away from um, the suit and tie. Mm. Um, and the actual credentials and, oh, I went to this college and I got this degree. There's some people out here in the streets that ain't never had no degree and they smarter than me. Mm. They move better than me. They work harder than me and they get the job done real fast. Um, and those people we need to tap tap into too. Like Keita was saying, the D-Boys, they got business plans and business strategies and they making something out of nothing. <laughs> they're going to get it. Done. And they know what the community need in spite of maybe some of the legalities of what they're doing. They they have good relationships with people in the community, store owners, business owners, and they got respect. They need to come to the table too. how we get them to the table um, with the relationship we have with the police and all that stuff. That's a whole different type of topic. That's a whole different subject and not necessarily my expertise, but I ain't lost sight. They, 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 they good leaders. They good leaders. Um, there was once upon a time in the community where there was a code you had to respect. A woman walked by, you put that away. An old person walked by, you show some respect. So mm -hmm. they got they got respect. They know the code. Like we need to bring them in and mm -hmm. stop exiling so many people because of what we think is right or wrong. Because none of us is perfect, and I fall short every day. Um, some people would even say I don't make a good leader because of some of the things that I've done um, and some of the things that I still have yet to, to learn. I'm kind of in between generations. I'm still kind of young, but I'm kind of old, depending on who you ask. If you ask my kids, they think I'm ancient. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we need to bridge those gaps in those relationships um, and we can start fostering better leaders if we stop sticking to a one-way system of getting things done. Like I was saying, these kids are into social media. They into they into uh instant results. They not necessarily delayed gratification type of type of generation. Um so we can find ways to reach them and birth new leaders. I think an effective leader is a leader who understands that you're not going to get it all done right away. You might not get it all done right. Leaning on their team, leaning on their support system. Like I don't have all the answers. There's things that I don't know that I that I think Amina may know. 
about working with previously incarcerated people. So I can tap in with her um, and get more information, putting my pride to the side, putting my ego down, knowing that it ain't about me and my personal success, but about the success of East Oakland, about the success of our community, San Francisco. And sometimes also being a good leader is saying, hey, I'm not a good leader. Let me step back and let me let Andre or let me let Amina take charge on this situation. I'm not necessarily an expert in, in that area or in that department. And also telling people, you know what? I'm not sure the answer to that. Let me get back to you instead of knowing the answer to everything. I don't know everything. And I know I don't know everything. Um, I'm grateful to be in an opportunity where I'm with other people that can teach me something. Um, so also being a good leader is, is, is being quiet sometimes um, and listening and getting more information. And also uh, an effective leader doesn't come to the table um, with all the answers, but maybe more questions. Mm -hmm. What would what would the people of East Oakland like to see? Maybe go ask them. Stop, uh, stop assuming that we want this and we want that and we need this and we need that. Ask me what I want. Ask me if I prefer salt and pepper with my grits versus sugar. Don't, don't, you know, like, um, and I think that makes for a good leader, building good relationships with people so that they can trust you. Um, and even when you get, even when you don't get it right, um, they still respect you and and, and they still rock with you. So. That Thank you, Karen. I, I know that Kita has to leave a little before everyone else. So Nick, I'm going to pass it to you to get a question in with Keita, and then I'll come back with a question for Amina and Andre. Well, how, how, how about this, Keita? Um, let's talk about your vision, because we know you are doing some good work in East Oakland, in deep East Oakland. So if you, in sharing your final thoughts, what's your vision? I know I see the the background. It says Black Futures, and this and actually this is a part of a series called Black Futures Redefined. So as we reimagine, and the reason why I chose redefinition is because there are some things from the past that we can bring forward, and then there are things that our kids and the next generation needs that may be uniquely different or look a little different because time is moving, it feels like time is moving a little bit faster. So what is your vision for the future of black economic mobility in Oakland in particular, because that's where your work is in deep East Oakland. And what actions do you believe need to happen to make this vision of reality? Yes, yes, thank you, um, loaded. <laughs> Um, yeah, first of all, yeah, shout out to East Oakland Futures Fest. So it's actually an East Oakland Futures Fest. It's a, um, I definitely deeply care about the future of East Oakland and I want residents to most start thinking about that all the time too. So, um, we on our third annual East Oakland Futures Fest. So it's a, um, annual block party on 90th where we come together and it's a way for me to try to talk about, not try, but we bring, um, the latest development projects that's happening in the area across different topics to, um, to bring people in a fun way to engage with it. Um, so just want to let y'all know about that. So again, 90th, if you know anything about 90, where Booker's is, um, one of the most infamous, you know, corridors, we actually have a, a scraper bike way now. So work with the scraper bike team, the, the, yoke, the local cultural keepers of the scraper bike. Um, they, the city of Oakland wanted to transform 90th to look like telegraph. So to have bike lanes on the end and do that parking um, or whatever. But again, we was like, no, nah, culturally, we do stuff different. We ride through the middle, blase, blase. Long story short, we got the city to do a city, um, the first um, kind of center bike lane or whatnot before San Francisco started doing it. And so, yeah, it's part of Scraper Bike Way. We wanted to celebrate that to show the innovation of East Oakland people and culture and how we doing things, even again, within the planning field. Um, but yes, it's an annual festival. Bring people out. It's safe. It ain't had no problems. Not a shooting, not a fight. Oh, no, I know. The people at Booker's, the deep boys, they come out. They have helped me throughout the whole time to make sure that this whole thing has been safe throughout the year of the annual festival. We go to Booker's and other places, even though it's a very controversial topic, Booker's. Um, again, it's just people that just want to live. But just wanted to put that out there. Like That's one of the big things for me um, that I put my time into in terms of the future of, of East Oakland. But in terms of a black, econo uh, black economic mobility, Oh, man, I'm going to take it back again to getting more of our youth and just 
uh, adults right now and just more into the urban professional um the urban professions that we have that are developing our cities uh that's developing our cities from, again from as what somebody said excavators we got drone photographers that can do surveying like you can just do uh yeah land surveying with drones you can do um GIS you can do 3D modeling like there's just so many different like aspects of planning and development that can be done and I, for me I would like to see that more dissected so that it's a, a more clear pipeline from elementary to middle to uh to uh merit not merit but to college and then beyond or whatnot like literally I didn't learn about urban planning until I was twenty three or right then twenty three or whatnot going to uh, going to merit already with a different profession and had to change course or whatnot and so I'm privileged to get to work with like the Castlemont Sustainable Urban Development Academy where they're learning about this stuff and working on real life projects now. So that's what I want to see for the future. I want to see more programs like SUDA, where we are working uh, and to see SUDA at an earlier level, like elementary or whatnot, so that they're really understanding, again, um, how to be more involved in their neighborhoods as a steward yeah. of the community and to be, to, um, to be forward thinkers and developers of it. I forgot to mention you can be a developer. We always forget that. We can we can plan, we can do GIS and land survey, and we can also be developers. I got homies that are developing from here to Africa or whatnot. So we can we I, I want to see a better pipeline to help us um get into the urban development so that we can really I can feel like we're really better reimagining our built environment. Sometimes in the work that I'm doing now, it's like sometimes contracts for the city and agencies that's you know kind of shaping. Again, stuff within their realm, but I want us to to um like take be proactive in creating um pipelines and lanes for this and our and our kids. Beautiful, Kita, you're giving me chills. Yes. Uh, for me to hear you speak the language of planning, mm -hmm. you go, you do it. Um, I want to do give a shout out to my mentor, who's been in my life since I was in the fourth grade. He's a retired educator, but he's still moving and shaking. His name is Romeo Garcia. When I came back to Atlanta, I just finished completing my degree in urban planning. He allowed me to teach a course called Introduction to Urban Planning in the Mills College Upward Bound Program to a group of high school students. So I'm saying that to preface the question I have for Amina. Yeah, you mean when you came back to Oakland from Atlanta. <laughs> when I came back to, thank you, Dr. Necker, my wife for correcting me. And I, when I came back to Oakland from Atlanta, that's right. He allowed me to teach that course. So Amina, this is my question for you. As a Can, just, just one quick second, really quick. Kia, yep. we're gonna have to, we, we gotta talk. Um, so we are so happy we ran back into you. We ran into you at the Oakland Futures Fest and yeah. we reconnected because I think th there's a need for an urban planning class. I, yeah. I, I think that's that's what I'm hearing. And so yeah. we, need to, we need to re reconnect. So I, I know you got to go soon. I just wanted to say that. So look out for some more emails and look out for possibly some more conversations. So thank and, you and, so and, much. And you know we have Summer Learning Institute we create online courses. Yeah, let's, hint, let's hint, definitely talk. Hint, hint, hint. Yes, yeah, let's definitely talk. I would love to do something like that. And I just want okay. to mention, I was, in the upper pro, I was in the Upper Bound program, and that's how I met Romeo Garcia. And wow. he's been one of my mentors ever since um, through Merritt College. Even now, he's living in Hawaii. But yes. I wonder if I took that. Uh, I don't know. It's been so long ago. But that would be so crazy. But <laughs> yes. Yes, full circle. Thank you all. It was nice to meet you, Corinne, Andre, and Amina. Um, hope to to uh, I definitely want to connect with y'all offline. So yes, yes, yes. Thank you for the work that y'all yes. doing. And we will have an offline meeting soon. <laughs> I'm going to be talking to Romeo tomorrow. I will tell him you said hello. Yes, please. Do. That's all I'm <laughs> about for sure. Yes. All right. All right. So, question, Amina, as a community. What are some creative ways that we can educate our next generation of young people about careers related to urban planning, economic development, mm -hmm. and community development? What are some creative ways that we can educate the next generation of young people about these careers? I love this question because this is essentially my job. <laughs> That's what I do. So we... 
um, do the workforce development and education services for the Reach Ashland Youth Center, which is the youth center in the Ashland, Sherrilyn area. If y'all familiar with that area, it's like a San Lorenzo incorporated area. Um, it's a youth center that was created by young people. And they literally said, like, these are the, the things we want to see from youth center. Can you make it happen? So as their workforce and education services provider, we literally come up with like new creative ways to kind of give them things that they're asking for. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the biggest ways that we can definitely improve this is partnering with what we do at the actual school level. So how we do it right now, we are funded through outside grants. So we're either funded through state agencies or private grants. And then we offer these workshops or these, um, we do a lot of like college tours. We took a bunch of kids to the Black College Expo last year. Um, we do a lot of, uh, we do what we call career spotlights. So we partner with a lot of um, local organizations and then we bring our young people to those organizations. So like we were able to tour the LinkedIn space. We were able to tour um, like the civic course space. We were able to partner with Rising Sun. So we go to like the, the Peralta schools and we're like, oh, you know, they can tour the construction, the machinist programs, things like that. I think a really good way though, what I would like to see in my own space and what I think could definitely benefit more people is if that was instituted at the actual school level, at the actual public school level. Because right now we're working around school schedules, right? So we have a lot of young people, they come from different schools. We have um we have some people in Oakland because we're partnering. We're trying to start a new connection going back to Oakland. We were in Oakland. We lost one of our grants in Oakland. So we moved to Holland Printer Center of our services to San Lorenzo. So we're going back to Oakland. We're partnering with like Oakland Tech and the Climans. And so what I would like to see, and I think that this has been the most beneficial, this is from what I've seen in my experience, is that when we have these programs actually on the school campus, they're a lot more effective. So we were previously at Ralph Bunch, and we actually have a program, a um, school safety violence prevention program at Redsdale Continuation. And we, you know, we partner with them all the time. And we're like, hey, we're going, like, for example, we're going to San Jose State. We're like, we would love to take some your kids, you know, up to San Jose State to do these things, blah, blah, blah. But I think that it's a lot more impactful if these are options as a electives at the actual school. So I think having these um having these additional courses as electives that are credit like they can actually earn credits for them at their school would make them a lot more impactful because it's kind of hard for some kids to get like across town or they have siblings they have to watch or they got other response. They have to work. They have other responsibilities. Right. So it can be a little bit difficult to get them to commit to like coming to the entrepreneurship program or entrepreneurship program two hours a day for eight weeks straight. Um, we had a small group of young girls of color and I'm very excited about that. But one of the things I noticed was like, we don't have any little boys. Like I would love to see some young men in this program. I would love to see some young black men in this program. Um, and I've noticed that's a really big challenge with a lot of these programs that we have. We have a lot of opportunities, a lot of funding opportunities, but we don't get a lot of young men in the programs at all. And we especially don't get a lot of young black men in these programs because for whatever reason, right? When I talk to them, they have other things going on. They have sports they have you know babysitting they have jobs they have other things they have to do so i think having these options as electives in their school where they can get credits for them would make them be a lot more impactful and i think it would actually give them the opportunity to actually take advantage of it right so like imagine you're in high school and then you have a um, you know, career services class that you can get actual graduation credit from. And in that class, you're learning how to do your tax preparation. You're actually doing career exploration, right? So you get to, and not like, I don't know how the school, so I went to school in San Leandro. I don't know how the schools in Oakland were because my parents, even though we lived in Oakland, my parents were like, you're going to school in San Leandro. So um, I'm not sure how you guys were had it, but at and at our school, we had something called RLP. I forgot what it stands for, mm -hmm. but it was like a program for people. Resource who opportunity to program. That's what it is. Thank you. So they they had opportunities they could do, right? I don't know if they had that in Oakland. I'm assuming they had something similar. I, okay. See, that's what I'm talking about. So <laughs> um, this program was kind of cool, though, because it was for kids who wanted to do other things, right? So maybe you didn't want to go to a four-year after school. You could do dental hygienist. You could do nursing. You could do veterinary. And you could do... They got them in Hayward. They have we work with Hayward. We work with Hayward uh, Eden area RLP all the time. Yep. So like they have those in Hayward. But like 
I think something like that in Oakland would be great. And, and not only just with those four pathways, right? So maybe opening up those pathways to more opportunities. You could do one in urban planning, right? You could do one in cosmetology. You could do one in mm-hmm. child care. You could do one in nursing and, and medicine and bio, you know, one in chemistry, like thing, having those um, career planning resource classes where you're getting the credits you're actually doing an internship. So you're actually getting some actual experience. You're building those relations with people who are doing the work who look like you. And then you're able to do it during school hours too. So it's a school sanctioned, you know, it's fully funded. You don't have to like come after school or on the weekends, you could do it during school hours. And I I think it gives you a lot more opportunity. I also think it opens the young person's mind up to some avenues that may not necessarily have existed for them. So I remember like when I was a kid, when we were in high school, we had this program called DECA and it was, a. Um, I was in DECA. I did a whole business plan. I think I wanted to do, um, I think my business was a beauty supply store. Buy everything you needed all at the same time. And like, it was just kind of fun, like building it out, but I had to build out a whole business plan. We had to come up with a marketing plan. We had to come up with financials. We had to pitch to investors. It was a full program. And that's actually what I modeled our entrepreneurship program after, because it really gave me an idea like, oh, this is really cool. Like, this is something I really could do. And I actually got to talk to, I actually got to meet with um, some black business owners. We pitched to some investors who gave us feedback on our pitches. And like, that's the same kind of, um, we do the same thing in our entrepreneurship workshop. So they get, they meet business owners in similar fields that they're in. They get to talk to people. They figure out their marketing plans. They come up with their financial documents. They pitch to investors. They meet with bankers, all those things. I did all those things at like 16 because I was able to do it at school. And it was a class that I actually got credits for. I don't see that being replicated a lot. And I see that as something that the young people are constantly asking for, especially now, because now you can build a whole brand off of Instagram now. Like that didn't exist when I was in high school. So like we have young people who are in our entrepreneurship class who already have businesses. They just, they can't figure out the financial and the marketing step. So the workshop is for them to build that extra piece, get all their paperwork in order, meet with bankers, meet with people who are doing the job so they can get to their next step. But they have to come after school and they have to come all the way. Some of them are coming from deep East Oakland and we're, we're paying for lifts and clipper cars and everything just to get them in, in the center so they can have a safe place to have those workshops. So I think like having those opportunities opportunities as credit, I keep saying credit recovery because we do credit recovery, but it's not credit recovery, as credit inducing, I guess, electives, um, I think can definitely be super beneficial because it just opens up their minds to figuring out different pathways, right? Like you don't have to take I think sometimes we do our young people a disservice because we try to tell our young people like, don't do this, ain't no money in that. Don't do this. There ain't no money in it. Don't do this because this isn't what you, you know, this is not going to be like, you know, you not, you shouldn't do that. That's not a good idea. You know, you should go into, I remember when I was younger, every, every young black girl was going into nursing. That was it. It was like, be a nurse, be a teacher. When I was in high school, I didn't want to be a nurse or a teacher. I wanted to actually, I was like, a talker. So I was like, I want to be Lala from MTV and I want to like, like be a VJ and I want to host like a show like TR. Like I wanted to go into communications and I was very, I was super into like geography and I was like, yeah, I want to do like a geography video thing. Like, I don't know what I want to do. And I remember everybody really discouraged me from that. Like, no, it ain't no money in that. You're going to go to school. You're going to waste your money doing communications. They're not going to hire some young black girl. You have an accent. You look a certain way. Like you're not like a TV person. Like, so you need to focus on like, you know, you're smart. You should do nursing. And I was not the nursing person. I don't like math. I don't like science. Like the the college I went to I actually went there to play volleyball. They were a nursing, they were huge, they had a huge nursing program. Immediately not for me. Wasn't for me. And so I went into the education program because they were like, you would be a really good teacher, kids love you, blah, blah, blah. And I spent a long time doing that. And I I convinced myself, like, oh yeah, you just gotta be a teacher. You just gotta go into education because this is a solid pathway for you. And I ended up getting into what I'm doing now literally by accident because I just applied for this random internship 
And then when I got in the internship, I started working with young people who were reentry because I came from people with reentry. My mother was a reentry person. She actually started her own business when she was released from prison. And I actually ended up working with a, a group of young mothers who were reentry mothers who were trying to start businesses. And then I realized like, oh, I'm really good at this. So I really focused a lot of my energy on that. But that was a pathway that I had never even heard of. I didn't even realize that that was a pathway, like reentry, nonprofit. Like, what is that? That's not something that I would have even ever thought to do. I would have still been kind of trying to make it work in education. So I think just having more avenues for young people, um, having avenues that are accessible to young people. So ones that they can actually access during school hours that are being facilitated by actual licensed and uh, credentialed professionals is big because I see that a lot in nonprofit services. I see a lot of people who I'm trying to think of a nice way to say this. I see a lot of people who um, maybe are not the most credible messengers, right? Like, how you gonna tell me to do something you ain't ever did? Mm -hmm. Like, I see a lot of people selling selling a product, but they actually haven't, or a service, but they actually don't have the credentials or the the background to be selling that. Um, and so, I think that does a disservice to our young people sometimes because then that can be hella discouraging because you feel like I wasted time and money on this pathway didn't pan out. So, having those options in school for young people that are accessible. Um, is a huge, huge, huge opportunity and not telling them to only go into STEM because that's the only way they're going to make some money. Like we got to stop telling our young black kids that because we need creatives, right? Like the STEM doesn't work without the arts, right? Humanities, you know, you need the science, like you need both sides of that. So I think for every doctor and engineer and, you know, whatever tech person, you need that writer, you need that artist, you need that philosopher, because we we really need both sides, I think, to really have a, a well-rounded community. So I think that's probably my long-winded answer. Thank you, Amina. That's <laughs> great. I know you mentioned uh, internships as well. Andre, we have about two questions for you, and then we're going to wrap this up. I'm going to ask the first question, and then Dr. Neck is going to ask it, and then we'll wrap up the session. This is an amazing, amazing um, community conversation. So, Andre, content knowledge is important, as we know, but our kids also need to have industry skills and skill-specific engagement. So what are some of the best and even non-traditional ways to help our children and youth develop the skills they need for today's workforce, like STEM skills, 21st century skills, project management. What are some of the best and non-traditional ways that we can help our kids develop these skills? Thank you, Chris. Um, number one, I think um, something that um, Amina said with our kids, when there's extracurriculum activities or specified activities, so many of them are not woven into the fabric of the school. So there's a disconnect between my primary education and these skills. So I believe everything should be based in the school. Everything should be funded by the school and everything should be treated as a priority. For example, um, I've been a part of a lot of personal development and life skill classes that schools said, we want you to come in and help our kids with. We wind up being <laughs> competing with lunch. We wind up being in a little closet area. So when the kids come in, one, oh, they must not really give a F about us. They sticking us in the closet. To the lunchtime or go over here to listen to somebody. I'm going to lunch. Or um, after school that you got to compete with those sports or in all those other things. So number one, whatever has to be done has to be woven into the fabric of school and it has to be treated as a primary class. Part of the content and part of the skills that the kids are going to work, walk out of there with so that they have the basic necessities needed in order to move into any direction that they want to from, uh, from high school. Now, saying that our kids 
are getting a tremendous amount of information through social media, through the internet, that way exceeds what we've been exposed to. Nine times out of 10, if you don't have an answer, you could go to your youngest child and ask them, oh yeah. So it's not about having information, it's about how that information is used, how it's presented, and the context of that information. So we have to set up useful ways for our kids to receive this information and along with critical thinking skills so that they can even see and understand that this is something that I can even see myself doing. Because a lot of times, if you don't believe you can, can you're not going to even try. So what our kids are used to seeing in terms of what the definition of success is looks so different than what they believe success is. And so what we have to do is first understand what success means to them, get them to understand or see if what would, if now that you know what success is, are you telling me what success is? How do you know when you're successful? What are the indicators that you've made it to this level? They explain that. How do you achieve those things so that you can be successful? Some have that answer, some do not. That's where the work becomes, becomes critical because then it's about, well, building this out, this, we're going to work together so that you accomplish these indicators so that you can be able to say, I'm on the track to success or I'm not on the track to success. And these are the avenues that you can take and we want to expose you to in order to get to in order to be successful. So what I'm saying is part of what needs to happen in those classes to prepare our kids for the next generation, they have to understand, they have to be able to get in and think critically and see that they are a part of the greater society. Because if again, going back to something that the panel said, if you scrub. If you're in a day-to-day -day fight for every minute, you ain't thinking about 20 years. You ain't thinking about sim sales. You're not thinking about necessarily um, learning how to be an artist or whatever the case may be. You're thinking about how I'm going to make it through this day. How am I not going to get hurt? How am I going to secure uh, a safe place to rest my head at? How are the utilities going to stay on? How I'm going to take care of my brother, my sister, and make sure everybody get eight. I mean, make sure everybody eat. And at the same time, they telling me I got to go to school. Man, when I showing up, I'm not even, my mind not even ready for that. So there's some basic things that we got to put in the place that allow kids, and I'm going to just say it, to be kids. I think when anybody look at their kids and they understand what their lives reflected ha has been, the one thing that you were able to do for your children was allow them to be kids. They didn't have to go and worry about all this other stuff so they could like play with their toys. They can like color. They can get exposed to different things. So we have to build all of that into the fabric of school so that the, again, the connection between what the nuts and the bolts of the content I need and what's the exploration of where I want to go and how I want to get there. Then you, you bring in these specified classes and courses coupled with everything. But if our kids are not in the state of mind or not in that presence in order to open up for that, then that's a closed door automatically. That's a closed door automatically. They don't know if now they could see stuff but that's for them over there. They had to have an op. They had they they was they their life took a different la a different pathway. This is where I am now. So to get them to understand that that can be you too. These are steps. I think it has to be a specialized class in there to be coupled with all those other experts and things to come in, and it has to be done at the school level. And so for me, that's why. If we notice that the public schools aren't working, forget it. We got to go and create our own school system. And we don't necessarily have to make sure that, well, 
I would say because you got to have all these um, accreditations and all this stuff that line up with the state and whatnot, there's certain things we can do and there's certain things that we have to do. I think we have to do it, somebody said, for us, by us. <laughs> we got, and, and in a lot of cases, we got to also develop schools where we can house our children in too. Because a lot of things that get hap that that gets done during the day gets undone between those hours that they go home. And we also mm -hmm. got to be honest in the say, some of the family situations aren't the best situations. And so um, we have to, so, you know, I could go on for, for, for some time on that. But to answer your question directly, the number one step is infusing these extra activities, which should not be extra. They should not be apart from, they should be, more activities, more content, and to address the actual need for that human being in that classroom, make sure those needs are met, and then the exposure can take place, or coupled with the exposure that take place in every day-to-day -day school curriculum. Wow. Well, in the last conversation, now we're getting to the end. In the last conversation, Freedom Schools, and, and, and Andre, you just said it. You, you, you just said it again. So this is the second conversation where we're hearing this. Mm -hmm. Freedom Schools and schools that center Black children came up. So this question goes, I'm asking this question, I'm posing this question to each of you. What is your vision for Black futures? Andre, we'll start with you. In a few sentences. All oh, right, that's the most important part. Right. 60 seconds. That's the challenge. <laughs> okay. What is your I, I, I think I can do it. To, okay. I, I, it encompasses a whole lot, and I'm going to give that time to, to these two lovely ladies because I think they can articulate a lot clearer than I can. Um, but I will say unapologetically Black. I don't care about anything else. I shouldn't have to feel ashamed because I want to work with black people, live with black people and prioritize black people. When so for me, prioritizing at the highest level, everything black. And that don't mean that I'm discounting anybody else. That just mean that I know that I got to put my energy, time, finances and everything in to the black community to get it to then we can say, okay, y'all, we can all uh, walk together. But I ain't even think, this might sound negative, but I ain't thinking about all of them because we got too many things going on for ourselves, going on within our own community. And, in, and so to get to where we want to go, we have to unequivocally from top to bottom for everybody to prioritize black people first. With that, I'll be complete. All right. And you did it in 60 seconds. Let's see if we can keep this going. Corinne. Um, I would say for Black future, uh, holistic health, mental health, emotional health, physical health, economic health, academic health. If we can focus on all those things and be healthy, then all those other things can come. Um, if we can get ourselves in a position of economic health, physical, emotional, mental, psychological health, all those other things will be added on to us. We will seek those other things out um, and we'll be successful in those other areas and we can thrive in those other areas. So for me, I would say our overall holistic health for Black future. Thank you, Amina. Um, I think I would say a future in which we really focus our energy on emotional intelligence and critical thinking skills. I think we place a lot more emphasis on um, economic growth and self-sufficiency, and that's great. But I think that the biggest issues plaguing our society right now, especially in the future of our society, are making sure that our young people practice um, good critical thinking and fact check those skills so that they're not taken advantage of by misinformation um, and actually really employing those skills for um, emotional intelligence because I see a lot of 
reactionary behavior in our young people. So that's what I would like to see. All right, Chris, you got it. All right, this this is this is amazing. So what have we heard from Keita, Karen, Andre, and Amina today? We need courageous leadership to help manage and act on community expectations on the inside and the outside. Someone who will actually serve the people. We need new leaders in public office who understand the needs and people of East Oakland and other aspects of Oakland. Leaders who can bridge gaps, help engender a sense of hope, and keep community citizens informed. We need people who look like us to help advocate for and make decisions for us and create opportunities for our children and youth. It's helpful to have people from the community to actually do the work in the community. So we need to broaden our perspective for determining who is ready to serve as leaders in our community. Formal preparation and lived experience both matter. There is a notable, noticeable difference in economic investment in different parts of Oakland. And we need to figure out how to make the funds more equitable across communities in Oakland. We need to expand the purpose of education to not only include preparation for careers and quality of life, but also to prepare the next generation for civic responsibility and to stay in the fight, to remain engaged in creating positive changes in the community. We need leadership in OUSD that values homegrown educators from Oakland who are committed to cultivating a spirit of excellence and service in students who live in Oakland. We need people at the state, district, and school levels to make decisions in the interest of our children and our community. Now, some creative ways that we can educate our youth about planning and community-related careers include tours, maybe, to city development and planning offices, partnerships with schools for on-site education programs and course electives, uh, creating curriculum for teachers to use to supplement their core curriculum, programs like CTE, ROP, and other pathways for career exposure and strategies for reaching children and people of color. Schools should lead in providing quality education for our children and youth that prepares them to compete, assume service and leadership positions in companies and agencies, and to lead a high quality of life. And then lastly, we need to help our children and youth enjoy their stage of development, having fun, building relationships with each other, having exposure to things, building community and family memories, and we need to help them define success and know when they are successful so that they can realize success for themselves. Mm -hmm.